I thought for those um, who hadn't had an opportunity to work and be exposed to Neuralink's technology, you could just share a little bit um, about your founder story and, and what made you interested in bringing computer interface in the first place. Sure. Well, this is going to sound somewhat esoteric and maybe a, a, you know, a bit strange, but I was actually trying to figure out how to mitigate the risk of digital superintelligence. To the degree that, that we can improve our bandwidth to our digital tertiary self, I think we can better align artificial intelligence with a collective human will. This is going to sound very strange, but so you can think of like basically our intelligence is being divided into roughly three areas. There's sort of like a like a you know limbic system, like like like, like the sort of instinctual elements that the sort of like the, the cortex and the, the planning part. Then we also have a tertiary layer, which is all the uh, computers and, and uh, phones, applications, software that we use. So that you, you have a digital tertiary self. You're, basically, we're already an Android, effectively. I think people feel this uh, when they forget their phone. It, it, you, forgetting your phone, leaving your phone behind is like having missing limb syndrome. You're missing your part of your digital tertiary. The constraint on human machine symbiosis is bandwidth. What is the, especially output bandwidth? The algorithm bandwidth of a human is less than one bit per second over the course of a day. So if you have 86,400 seconds in a day, the number of output bits that you produce, maybe there's some rare cases where it's above one bit per second, but you, you, very few people produce 86,400 output bits. So most people are, are averaging less than one bit per second over a 24 hour period. And when we do speak, they say the number of symbols per second of speech typing is quite low, especially if it's going through a phone. Then you just sort of have two slow moving meat sticks that are trying to type letters on a phone. So you really have just a few taps per second of characters. So your phone is like a supercomputer in your hands, and uh, it is desperately trying to figure out what you want to say. So that's, as a starting point, what prompted yeah. your interest in Neuralink. Yeah, so basically I thought, okay, in, in order to have better human AI symbiosis, we must solve the bandwidth problem. Below a certain bandwidth, we are basically just stationary to a computer. And at one bit per second, you know, that's a very low data rate when computers are doing trillions of bits per second. So when you think about brain-machine yeah. interface, why did you select the technical approach you did? I know a lot of thought's gone into that. Yeah, so if you say, like, okay, we need to have ultimately a million bits per second or a, a billion bits per second, gigabit per second interface, then that means you really, you can't, you, you need an implant. You, and ultimately, we'll need to replace the skull, and it's going to be a zillion wire. I mean, this is some sci-fi, bizarre sci-fi stuff. I'm not, this is certainly optional, hopefully. <laughs> Man mandatory replacement of my skull, whatever yeah, problem. Man mandatory chip and brain is not what we're saying here for sure. But at a certain point, you, could, you say like, okay, well, how many electrodes are needed in order to interface with, have a whole brain interface? Yeah, you know, I've heard you mention that larger goal of whole brain interface. One thing that's really struck me by the approach that's been taken is, I think as neurosurgeons, we often uh, contemplate the natural history of the disease and competing risk and benefit. And Neuralink, uh, as a company, has started with folks who have ALS and spinal cord injury, yeah. these kind of first steps in terms of technical approach. So, so we'd absolutely. love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Long-term goal, like I said, is uh, mitigating civilizational risk associated with a divergence of biological and digital intelligence. That's the long-term goal. Obviously, then you've got to parse that into, like, well, what are we going to do tomorrow? Yeah. Um, so the, the starting point with the, the first Neuralink device is uh, 1,000 electrodes. And with just 100 of those electrodes active, if you take our, our first few patients, you know, we, we are setting world records. Admittedly, these are world records that are pretty low. But we're getting around 10 bits per second. Mm -hmm. And there's a path to 1,000 bits per second, which would be literally 100 times more than the next record. So we want to do the implants in where there's the highest gain and the least risk. So we call the first implant uh, telepathy, which really just interfacing with the motor cortex, and it's basically looking at signals as though somebody moved their arm, and, and just re reading that signal, and then sending that signal to the, to the patient's phone or computer, so they can then move the cursor around just by thinking. If, if people have seen the videos of Noland, that's pretty impressive what he can do. In fact, shortly after getting the implant, he, he spent all night playing video games just by thinking. And I think we'll get to the point pretty quickly where someone with a Neuralink implant will outperform somebody who's using their hands to play a video game. What, what do you um, think the timeline for that is? We won't hold you to it. Sure. I, I mean, I, I do have a habit of being optimistic with respect to timelines. But if I, if I wasn't optimistic, I wouldn't be starting these companies, probably. Yeah, yeah. that's um, fair. So, but I, I think, given that we're already pretty much at a point where we're pretty close to on par with the, the video game, basically, you can play a video game at a comparable level to someone with hands, I think with our second generation device, uh, which will have 3,000 electrodes, and we'll, we'll get a lot better at, at placing those electrodes, so only, it's only 100 electrodes being effective, we'll both improve the yield and we'll increase the number of electrodes. So we'll go from, say, 100 electrodes that are reading to, I don't know, out of 3,000 electrodes, maybe 15 half, so like 1,500 are reading. So yeah. at that point, the data rate is far in excess of what someone playing a video game with their hands could do. And we can reduce the latency. The moment you think of a move, it, it happens instantly on the computer, as opposed to what, you know, Currently, if you, if you play a video game, you have to move your hand. So that's like you've got to send signals to the muscles. The muscles have to move. The, the, your, your finger takes a certain amount of time to move. 
So you, you've got to be, you basically got to move the meat puppet. If you don't have to move, actuate the muscles in your hand. Your fingers can move at a certain rate and set like millimeters per second. But if you don't have to do any of that, you can literally think it immediately with no latency. You'll outperform someone who has to use a hand. Can yeah. you share a little bit in this early journey with BCI what some of the challenges have been? What you've encountered technically? I know in the biological environment, the salt water problem is very hostile. I mean, things with energy transfer. Indeed. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that and how your, how your team's uh, taking those things on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as everyone, I'm obviously talking to people that, that know a lot more about the brain and have, <laughs> that, 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 than I do, but I, I've certainly come to understand more than most people. The challenge is you've got a device that's gonna live there for years. It's an electrical device that has to transmit radio, essentially, you know, has to transmit photons to a computer. It's subcutaneous. It's got to be charged. It's got electrodes that are reading and writing. So it's not like it can't just be electrically isolated. In fact, you, you're fighting two things. You want you really are desperately trying to read these neurons, but you also don't want to be corroded. <laughs> so it's like a very difficult thing to have just the minimum amount of insulation necessary to not be corroded, but not be so insulated that you can't hear the neurons. So there's a very challenging materials problem. With our latest electrodes, there'll be silicon carbide coated, but even the silicon carbide is a very difficult material to work with. It's awesome, but it's very difficult. And you've got to make sure the coating is, is extremely precise. It's, it's got to be, you know, can't be too thin or too thick anywhere. It's got to be very evenly, uh, you know, applied to the threads. So I, I, it's, the sheer number of iterations necessary to actually have this device be medically sealed and survive in the body and not fail in some way, and then uh, the, have it be able to transmit to your phone or computer uh, at a high data rate without burning down the battery is, is very difficult. I'd say there's many, many technical challenges in that. So I, I mean, I do have slightly trivialized by saying it's sort of like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch in your brain. But if you actually put those things in your brain, you, neither your brain nor the Apple Watch or Fitbit would be happy. So this feels like the right place to, to ask, I think, one of the more interesting questions um, we received. So as someone who's in a, a position of authority to comment on both, can you settle the age-old question? What's actually more difficult, brain surgery or rocket science? <laughs> well, they're both quite challenging. It's bizarre that I'm involved in both. I mean, I think they're of, of similar magnitude of difficulty. Especially so, the story, when, so the story checks out. <laughs> yes. I think nobody's out there thinking, you know, what's easy? Brain surgery and rockets. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> thanks thanks for backing us up. We appreciate it. Yeah, that. 100%. No, that's uh, legit. Brain surgery is super hard and rockets are super hard. And there's a reason that they're idiomatic expressions. This is no accident, especially as you try to scale the electrodes, number of electrodes. And, and I, I don't, we don't know how to get, say, like, ultimately get to say, how do we do a million electrodes? This is, we don't know that, how to do that yet, except that hopefully it is physically possible. If, if you want to have a high bandwidth a whole brain interface, then I think probably the right order of magnitude is, is something like a million electrodes. And that, that still has a very high ratio of neurons to electrodes. So that means you've got to read, you know, try to, like any given electrode has to be able to read neurons from, you know, several, like, I don't know, a hundred or a thousand neurons. So if you can do, if you've got a million electrodes and each electrode can read a thousand neurons, so you've got access to a billion neurons. Well, the goal with um, a whole brain interface is this um, potential for long-term augmentation or symbiosis. But you know, in the more immediate term, something that we think a lot about as surgeons is how is technology going to allow us to treat problems that we aren't able to treat now? And, yeah. and there's this whole family um, of diseases, psychiatric conditions, um, neurodevelopmental yep. conditions, you know, folks who are neurodiverse, and neurodegenerative conditions um, like Alzheimer's. And so as we get a better picture um, of not just the structure of the brain, but you know, for lack of a better term, the music of the brain, um, do yeah. you see those as intermediate steps? We'd, lo we'd love to hear your perspective. On it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we should be able to solve any problem over time that is a result of, you know, if, like if you think of the brain like a computer, like, like a circuit board or, or something like that, you can say like, if you're given a circuit board and there were some short circuits or some circuits that should be there but aren't there, if there are any circuits that, that shouldn't be there and, and, and some that, that are there but shouldn't, we, we can fix those. So basically, if, 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 it, if it's, it's like fixing a circuit board. Now, now, if the circuit board is all melted, it's, it's going to be hard to fix a melted circuit board. You can fix the circuit board with, with a, a few issues but you can't fix it if it's been melted. But, but the vast majority of, of diseases or, or brain issues, I think, are fixable with, neuro, with a neural link device. It's, it's a, it's a fine-grained means of, of reading and writing electrical signals in the brain at a very, with high precision. And so that means like, if there's an electrical storm, some kind of epilepsy or something, you, you can interrupt that storm. If, you can, if there are a set of signals to read, like in the case of blindness, uh, if, if somebody's lost their optic nerve or both eyes, you can still stimulate the visual cortex Basically, anything that is a function of signals in or out, if that is the nature of the problem, it can be fixed ultimately with a neural device. One other issue that comes up with implants that you were mentioning are iPhones. When you're committing someone to an implant, obviously there's a whole issue around upgrades or the yes, cycle time, upgrades. or iteration of technology. Yep. So you can maybe say a little bit about reversibility and, and how we should be thinking about these things as, as we enter an era where BCI will become more widespread? Yeah, so we, we do think upgrades are pretty important. Just as you would not want an iPhone 1 stuck in your head when there's an iPhone 16 or whatever version of iPhone they're on these days. And so we've designed the implant such that it can be removed. 
but with hopefully minimal strip, you know, damage to, to the area. So you can then re put, uh, replace it with another one. And, and we have with, in our animal studies, we've, re we've done, I think, three implants. And the third implant will still worked quite well. It, Meaning was, you've replaced the implant three times in a single We've replaced it three times, yeah. And, and, and the, the third one was still working, was working great. So. so we've talked about the robot addressing the workforce problem. We've talked about um, interchangeability. You know, a, a lot of what your vision involves is being high performing, but also affordable. So it'd be accessible yes. to people. Um, how do you see uh, bridging that gap? Yeah, so the device itself in, in volume should, should not be super expensive. I mean, hopefully it's like, I don't know, five to $10,000 and, 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 and very high volume it should start to approximate the cost of an Apple Watch or a, a phone. So maybe it's a, a thousand or two thousand dollars, something like that. And then the, if it's implanted with a robot, then that, that surgical procedure sh should be fast. Like we, we do have a game plan for what I call the 600 second surgery. So ten, 10 minutes, you sit in the chair, and 10 minutes later, you have an implant. And we're, we're not violating physics. So, it, I mean, just, just as with LASIK, you know, it goes in a laser, does a whole bunch of things to survival. Now, you'd have to automate basically everything here. but. It, if you break it down second by second, it is possible to have a, a 600 second or 10 minute surgery. Um, and so at that point, if it's, if it's being done by a robot and, and it's, the whole thing takes 10 minutes, I, I think it probably, the, the whole thing, all inclusive, ends up being you know, on the order of $5,000 maybe, so, similar to LASIK. Mm -hmm. And you have all of uh, neurosurgery in the room here. And so what are maybe some last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Well, I, I think this is gonna be something that is an incredibly powerful tool for neurosurgeons, for helping fix things that are brain-related issues. It's sort of like, you know, it, it might be like the difference between, if, if it was a weapon situation, the difference between like bows and arrows and jet airplanes. Like it's a big difference, <laughs> you know? So we want to give you- I, I hope I have the airplane <laughs> in that, in that Yeah, I mean, in a positive, constructive way. I mean, one can only do as well as the tools that one is getting, you know, if, 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 what, it's like what tools do you have? And I think with by essentially giving neuro neurosurgeons a much more sophisticated, powerful tool like the Neuralink device, it, you could really um, help a lot of people. Terrific, and I, and I know um, that's why we're all here to, to better characterize neurologic disease and, and to help people. So uh, really um, value your perspective. Uh, thank you for being um, our puzzle lecturer um, for creativity and innovation. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.